Welcome to the Psychology World Podcast. I'm O'Connor Whiteley, bringing you psychology news, articles and other interesting psychology related articles. You are welcome to find the podcast notes and more interesting psychology related things and you can get your free 8 psychology book box set at connorwhitely.net. Now let's get on to the show. Hi everyone and welcome to episode 99 of the Psychology World Podcast with me Connor Whiteley. And today's episode is on what to say to someone when someone's died. And it's Saturday the 26th of June 2021 as I record this. So this is something that's a really good, really applicable episode that I've actually been meaning to do for a good month or two because um, another family member died back in March, April though. So I've been really wanting to do this like just so this will hopefully help you and help um, your friends and family comfort you or them i don't know where i'm going with this when someone dies so hopefully you'll find this really really useful and i really do recommend it so we will look at what you should say to someone but also what you shouldn't and some of the ones you shouldn't say i absolutely love (laughs) because they're so true moving on to the psychology news section as always we're in from the british psychological society research digest and there's some rather interesting ones today we like the original versions of abstract artworks more than the colour shifted ones, and now I do not know what that means. Take a look at this 1930 painting, Rhythm of a Joy, by French artist Robert Gillandier. Probably butchered that. Do you find it colourful and do you like it? And of course, you can't see this, but um, you're going to get the idea of this. What if every pixel in a digital version was rotated an equal distance on a colour wheel that represents every colour that people can see? Technically, the number of different colours in the image would be the same, but you'll probably perceive it as less colourful, and even if you've never seen the original before, you'll probably like it less. That, at least, is the conclusion of a fascinating new paper in Journal of Experimental Psychology, Human Perception and Performance. This work contributes to our understanding not only of why certain colours are more common in art, but also how we perceive colours. This definitely taps into colour psychology, and I might actually look into this a bit more and try and like do something that way because yes, um, colour psychology is a bit more in the pseudo psychology and a bit more in the pop psychology bit, which of course I stay away from because this is a proper psychology podcast. But it's always interesting though. And I've actually clicked onto the article a bit more that you can find at digest.bps.org.uk. And yeah, wow, some of these do look a lot less colourful. So that's actually really interesting though. And this is just shows the importance of actually studying um, perception. So another one is, and this one I do like. Child-free adults are just as satisfied with their lives as parents. And this might do a clinical psychology reflection on. Across the world, birth rates are dropping. The global fertility rate has halved since 1950, with indications that this will continue to fall. There are a number of suggestions as to why this is the case. Women may stay in education or the workforce rather than have multiple children, for instance, and many people across the world now have much greater access to contraception. But many adults have also explicitly decided not to have children, instead choosing to be child-free. The child-free movement has rapidly grown over the last few years, the r slash child free sub reddit has over 1.4 million subscribers whilst media coverage has been proliferated in the US and the UK. But are the child free missing out on the joys of becoming parents? According to a new study, that isn't the case. Child free are just as satisfied with their lives as parents. And this, I think, is such an interesting idea because I also come from a slight geography background back in my sixth form. So that's the um, 16 to 18 um, year old education here in the UK. And I also did geography for that. So I do know a lot about this area, about the drop in fertility rates. Then you've also got like the pro natalist policies. Like France actually has some really good policies about trying to encourage people to have more children. At least last time I checked that. But this is a really good one. But I think the real um, comment at the end of this psychology news section or article is just if you don't want children, that is fine. Don't let anyone press you. At the end of the day, it's your life and you need to do what's right for you. And we will do one more. Regular gamblers turn to online gambling during the pandemic. Gambling is a big business in the UK. According to NHS Digital, 57% of men and 40, 54% of women reported gambling in 2018, whilst the Gambling Commission suggests that online gambling grew by 8.1% from 2019 to 2020. During the pandemic, gambling changed quite significantly. Whilst customers could still buy scratch cards and lottery tickets in supermarkets and off licenses, 
Betting shops were closed and sports matches cancelled, leading many activities to move entirely online. And according to a new study from researchers at the University of Bristol, although the British public gambled less overall during lockdown, amongst regular gamblers, rates of online gambling increased substantially. So this, I think, is um, one that we definitely need to be like careful of and that we also need to watch it because, uh, as we know, that like gambling getting into debt can have can actually have massive impacts on our mental health and of course these would be like negative and then also like um excessive gambling that can like lead to family breakdown relationship breakdown so we do need to watch this but i still think it's uh, quite interesting so that's enough the psychology news section so let's move on to the personal update so we're moving on to personal updates uh, there's not been a great amount of like psychology things that i want to share this week so this personal update should actually be quite short because i've mainly been focusing on fiction and i've also been attending london a book fair which is all about publishing and all of that um so i'd fit in a clue in it there's a great mental health talk that I, that I actually still need to watch because it was spoken about it um at the london a book fair because it was about uh, it was something along the lines of helping teenage mental health through fiction which i'm really interested so I do I've got to watch that I might try and watch it tonight actually um yes and then I almost really do a, a podcast episode about it though because because I did a, a podcast episode back in the 50s yeah yeah well like not the 1950s like the 50s range of the podcast um about the ultimate stress of reducer according to a, a new study and that said that fiction is a great way to reduce stress I really might do a, a podcast episode on it so that might be episode 101 but just to say I cannot believe we're at episode 99 i'm really looking forward to next week because it's the big episode 100 i really am looking forward to that and i just want to say thank you for all for listening though and i know i'm going to be saying like that again like next week because it's the big episode but i really do appreciate all of you listening to this though and to be honest there's absolutely nothing more to say in this personal update except for my, i will be doing a coat psychology book that i really am looking forward to and i'll almost probably be researching that this week and then I will also be in the Clinical Psychology Reflections book, which I'm absolutely like loving. I'm not really sure how many people are going to be interested in that, because that's my thoughts and feelings uh, through a, a clinical psychology lens on a different psychology topic. So that's, I don't know though, but like, because yes, it's all based on a clinical psychology, the facts, the studies and everything, but this is more my take on it though. So I really am looking forward to that and actually like releasing that out. And then the only other book that I've got rattling around in my head at the moment, uh, and all of these will probably be coming out January next year, is, uh, is that there's a police psychology book, or oh, and actually there's a hostage and um, terrorism book that I'm interested in doing. And both of those are forensic psychology. So I'm rattling around with them and if I do them, they will be coming out January next year. So I really am looking forward to this. I've got so many great books too that I want to write and share with you all. So as always, I would like, love to know your thoughts and feelings on today's episode. So you can always email me, conwhitely, conwhitely.net. You can always leave a comment on the show notes at conwhitely.net forward slash podcast. And you can always tweet me on Twitter at sci-fi whitely. And this episode has been sponsored by Social Psychology, a guide to social and cultural psychology. So this is a brand new edition. It came out April of this year. So it's a great book. It goes into so much great depth about social psychology, social groups, and everything that can influence us at a, a social level. It also goes into our group processes, persuasion, group influence, and then it also goes into the more controversial studies in social psychology, for example, the Milgram study. And it actually goes into something that no one talks about, which is that the Milgram study, what actually happened wasn't necessarily what was reported so i really do recommend the book just for that so reason so it goes into so much depth so much great easy to understand fun and people really do enjoy reading this book though so that is social psychology a guide to social and cultural psychology available on all major ebook retailers and you can order the paperback hardback and large print version from amazon or your local bookstore and you can get the ebook and the print editions for free at your local library if you request them and you the ebook are directly from me at payhip.com forward slash connor whitey so that's another personal update let's move on to the content part of today's episode so we're moving on to the content part of today's episode so we're going to be talking about what to say to someone when someone starts though so yes this is quite a sad focused episode but uh, but i really do want to help you in a case you ever need to comfort someone or in case uh, someone ever needs to comfort comfort you though sadly 
death is a part of life and so it's a grief we cannot get around that that's a part of life but sometimes it can also be quite beneficial so i won't go into that in this podcast episode but that's an awareness thing but sometimes people make really terrible mistakes when trying to comfort people and i think we've all experienced this we've all experienced when someone's trying to be helpful but they end up making it worse and we just wish they would go away So the structure of this podcast episode is that I'll talk about what you should say and then later on I'll go and say what you just shouldn't say. And of course this isn't any sort of official advice but I just want to help you and some of this might like resonate with you in a case like you're grieving at this time. So the first one is they'll be missed. So this really is such a simple phrase and to be honest it's sort of one of those things that you just just sort of like say it to people although because it's so simple and it can actually be really impactful which is always nice simply because it shows that the grieving person is not alone and that's what and that's what we want and there are other people grieving as well and as we know from social psychology it all comes back to feeling a part of a social group and we know that social groups provide us with support which in turn helps our mental health so just by saying that this little phrase can really help someone to feel a part of a group and that they're not alone in their grief and it also helps to maintain their mental health as well which is always good so this is really important and this is such a simple little phrase to say though and on a personal note I remember this one a lot from when my great uncle died because there were a lot of people grieving and upset and even though this sounds sad there was a slight benefit to it because it meant that we all knew that we weren't alone in our suffering and in our emotional pain so we all knew and we did talk talk to each other about our grief and this did help so another one is I remember when so this part I really do like it because the friends and family members telling each other stories and memories of the deceased is a great way to cope. I really, I really do love this point because you can remember them and honour their memory. So like for example, if a family member had a little quirk, then you can remember that and share stories about it. For example, my grandma, she always used to tap people on the arm when she spoke if he were family. So it's a long running joke between me and my parents that occasionally tapping my mum on the arm because it was my mum who had noticed it, it first though so that sounds really weird but it's just a little quirk that we like talk about and that we remember her by so the point of this is just share the memories stories and jokes so that can help the person still feel alive and it can make the grieving of people feel better so the last thing that you should just say of course this is not the complete list but you but can say let me bring dinner of course, you don't have to say like exactly that, but you'll see what I mean in a moment. I, so to be honest, when I first read this, I was not sure on this point. But this section is all about offering practical help to the grieving person. Since the problem with asking the grieving person how to help, what can you do amongst other things, this can actually place an undue burden on them, which of course we don't want. No one ever wants to burden the grieving person because they've got enough on their plate already because they've got stuff like funerals to arrange um, wills estates etc so we don't want to burden them so what you could do in a, in a stead is that if you offer a few possibilities then the grieving person can decide quickly and easily well easily though but of course this does depend on your relationship for example if your best friend asks do you want to them to look after your children then you're probably going to say yes if your strange uncle offers the same thing then you're probably going to say no i know i would i just wouldn't it's just now it's just it's just not appropriate for the relationship that you have so you've just got to think about it like that so but the point of this is that you've just got to is that if you want to be helpful take initiative so now i want to to move on to what not to say some of these are brilliant so I really do love this next section because we need to, you know, because some of this is just so applicable and if any of these do resonate, please email me. I just think it'd be like um, a great little conversation. <laughs> okay, so the first one is at least. So what you sort of say here though is like at least they're in a better place. At least they're no longer in that pain. At least etc. And I've always been like, really, when someone like says this though, because the problem with saying this is, yes, you are trying to be nice, you're trying to be empathetic with the grieving person. But the problem is, is that this does plays at the loss. Well, you're sort of saying like, don't be upset, they're in a better place, move on. And at least, I don't know though, I don't know how to phrase it, but it really does downplay at the loss. Because it really does sound, and it does in apply, that the deceased person is, uh, is uh, better off and that there's no reason to grieve for them. So... 
I just wouldn't recommend saying it. And I did hear this a lot when my great uncle died, but it was never the most welcoming or best thing to say. And and in a said that I always preferred the I remember when a point out because they're more welcoming, they're more warm for, and everything. So the next one is my favourite. And I'm not trying to offend anyone, but I hate it. Hate it with an absolute passion when someone said it's God's plan. Now I'm not anti-religious. If you're religion, that's a fine. But when it comes to when, but when someone's dead, I really do not see the point of saying this. But I will counter this. So of course, if you're part of a religious community, then yes, it's fine, and it might be a good idea to offer some sort of spiritual guidance. But if you're not part of such a community, I just do not see why this is a good idea. Simply because, as I've already said. I'm not anti-religious, but this point is so insensitive because I sort of feel with that you're basically saying you need to stop grieving. This is part of the plan, so please let God let in you and you need to pull yourself together and fulfil your part. And in a more general sense, this saying really does undermine the effects that this has on the family and friends who are grieving them because, because it's just not a very good thing to say though. So the last one is, I know how you feel. So we've all said this. We really all have, and we all want to try and be comforting. And sadly, it, this is not very comforting, simply because whilst it may seem like you're trying to help them and emphasise with the grieving person, you're actually shifting the centre of the grief to you and not the person that you're trying to help. And on a more personal note, whenever I hear this or whenever someone says this to me, I know they're trying to be nice, but I tend to think, no, you don't. I'm sorry, but you aren't me. You weren't as close as I was to my whoever who died so please don't pretend you know how I feel feel though and also though as we also know from social psychology we nine times out of ten and also into cognitive psychology we don't know how we feel so you get the idea so this is really bad though so so I just want to wrap up today's episode by saying there is no one way to grieve because everyone is different and we all have very different coping mechanisms I really hope that you got something out of today's episode and I really hope that this will benefit you in the future or this will help you to become a better friend perhaps when you have to comfort someone because sadly as I've already said death is a part of life but having a good social network can really help though so I really hope that you enjoyed today's episode if you know someone who would enjoy today's episode then please share it with them I'm always really grateful when you wonderful people help spread the word about the uh, the uh, podcast also please uh, check out uh, social psychology a guide to social and social psychology available from all major online retailers and you can get the payback print book and hardback versions from amazon or, or your local bookstore so have a great day everyone and i'll see you next time Thanks for listening today. I hope you enjoyed it. If you want to see the show notes, then please go to connorwhitely.net. And if you want a free eight book psychology box set, then please go to connorwhitely.net. Have a great day and I'll see you next time.